Welcome everybody to the final session of the day. My name is Brian Tipper. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing here at OptiWave, and I'll be sitting alongside your host, Damian Merrick. In this presentation, we'll be taking a closer look at some advanced applications using our OptiFDTD software package. And before we begin, let's uh, just outline a few things. Uh, first off, we'll be launching three polls during the course of the webinar. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate if uh, everybody could answer uh, the polls. And also, if you are present for all three polls, we will uh, enter you into our $50 gift card draw at the end of the session. Uh, during the last two polls, we'll also have uh, question and answer periods. Uh, the first one is about 20 minutes in, and the second one is at the end of the uh, webinar. And finally, uh, we're going to be recording this webinar and distributing it to everybody that registered. Uh, you'll receive a video link via email tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let me now welcome your presenter, our Senior Photonics Application Engineer, Damon Merrick. Hello, everyone, and thanks, Brian, for the introduction. So as already been discussed, today we'll be looking at a more advanced application, how to build it, and how to, um, this one will be from the literature, so we'll be trying to reproduce some of the results that uh, this paper has gotten, a uh, pretty famous paper. All right, and that uh, paper has to do with finding the quality factor of a cavity of a photonic band gap micro cavity. So let's start off with um, looking at the structure here. I also have an outline on the left side here, but I mostly wanted just to show a picture from this reference where they have in the top right uh, a, they have a waveguide, silicon on silica waveguide, like a rib waveguide, and it should be single mode. So when we make this uh, design file, we should uh, investigate and make sure this is a single mode operating waveguide here, as reported in the paper. And what's happened is they've etched some air holes uh, along the waveguide for them, to be exact. One, two, three, four. All the spacing of a. 0.42 micrometers, and um, <clears throat> they also have uh, a second section of cavities, second second section of air holes right after, and so this cavity is going to allow uh, the signal on the left input side of the uh, of the um, waveguide to reach the output. Otherwise, sort of like a grating, you know, if you have a periodic structure, it's going to have some reflection band that it will not let frequencies pass through. However, if we place a cavity or a defect in this sort of 1D crystal structure, we'll be able to excite it since it can, some of the field will be able to make it through this initial section of the grating, well, photonic type band gap crystal, crystal structure, excite the cavity in the middle here, and then when this cavity is excited, it's going to contain the light, but as it oscillates, it's going to give off waves both in the reverse direction and also in the forward direction. <clears throat> and we should see this type of response here in the transmission spectrum. So we have this reflection band going from just over, let's say, 1350 nanometers to about 1700 nanometers. And then in the middle, where this cavity is at, will be at res resonance, we'll get this transmission peak because the light's going to be leaking through this initial part, exciting the cavity, uh, cavity mode, and then this cavity mode will leak out some light in the direction of this waveguide. So after we set this up and talk about some of the ways of calculating the quality factor of a cavity, we'll also I'll talk about uh, some I'll do the simulate I'll show the simulation results, and then also. I'll talk about some cavity specific issues you need to keep in mind when you're doing FDTD simulations. Okay, so there's two main in optics, there are two main ways that I'm aware of, at least, of how to calculate the quality factor of a cavity. The first method comes from the spectrum that the oscillator or cavity is going to have, and you calculate this uh, quality factor by taking the central frequency or the dual, you can also do it with wavelength. Take the central wavelength here, lambda, and divide it by the full width half maximum 
uh, bandwidth delta lambda. And this will give you the quality factor of a cavity. Another way of calculating the quality factor, and not exactly the same, it won't give exactly the same result, is it describes a cavity by the total energy of the cavity and the power loss per cycle times 2 pi. At the limit where the quality factor is very large, these, both, these two different definitions will be approximately equal. However, in the paper that we're going to be reproducing, they use this definition up here because it'll be easier to describe the cavity that way in our simulation because we don't, it'll be more difficult to calculate the total energy in the cavity and how much is being lost each cycle. So we're going to be calculating using the central lambda and then also the band gap, or sorry, not band gap, the bandwidth uh, delta lambda. So we're going to attempt to set up that initial design there in the paper. Let me just go back and show it to you again. Remember, there's a substrate. This substrate down here is going to be too far away from the simulation domain, so we're not actually going to see it. This is the silicon. They've deposited, or, or at least they've gotten a wafer with some type of silica deposition on it. It should be about one micron thick. They've also deposited a silicon on top of that, and then using photolithography and patterning, they've etched away one micron or sorry, they've etched 0.55 microns down again. So we want to make this waveguide uh, total height to be 0.55 microns. These air holes should pass through uh, ex the whole waveguide, which will be, uh, again, 0.55 microns, and the width will be 0.47, and the thickness of this top silicon layer should be 0.2 microns. So I'll keep it open on this uh, slide while I generate this layout in Opti FDTD. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is set up the wafer by creating a new project. I'll just go ahead and save this right off the bat and I will call it why not cavity. Uh, cavity, yep. Yeah. And from some previous attempts, I've found a good um, simulation domain, which will make the simulations somewhat reasonable. And those are, the length is going to be 5.5. Um, this must have saved my previous options because it's exactly what I want. The width will be 1.8. The light's going to be pretty strongly confined to the silicon waveguide, so we, we can take advantage of that and use a smaller simulation domain. All right, and the, the air surrounding is going to be about one micron. And the substrate, we're going to model the substrate up to uh, half a micron. And now let's define some of these materials that we'll be using. And again, these, were these numbers I'm going to be taking from the paper that they used. So I'm going to define a new one here. I'm going to call it silicon, SI, and it has a refractive index at, uh, we're going to be doing the simulation at about 1550. That will be the central wavelength of interest. And silicon has about 3.4785. That's what they used, at least in the paper. So we have this material model now of silicon. And we're going to go ahead and add another one. And this one is going to be silica, which is SiO2. We'll name it that way. And it has a refractive index, not actually uh, described in the paper, which is sort of unfortunate. However, we can uh, use a different source for it. So I just found a source online for an approximate silica at this wavelength. <clears throat> depending on the type of house deposited and all that, it, it can change by a couple percent easily. But we'll just hope that this is good enough. It should be. So now we have our main materials. Air is already a default uh, dielectric, so we can just use that uh, value there. That's fine. It's similar to the properties of a vacuum. And now we're going to define that waveguide, that ridge waveguide, that we're going to draw in the layout. So it's going to be a channel type, so I'll right-click and hit new, and now I can call it channel profile, uh, and I'll just call it 
SI for silicon because it's, uh, it's made of silicon and silica. If we want to view it in the 2D viewers, uh, we can use silicon. So this won't really matter for 3D. It won't use this material definition because it's a 3D shape. But when we look at the 2D viewer, it'll help to be able to see it uh, more clearly if we add the actual value. And we're going to add some layers to it. So the bottom layer is the, I'll call it layer SiO2. This is that, well, maybe I'll capitalize the O. This is that silk, silica layer at the bottom of the waveguide. And it has a width of 0.47 microns and a thickness of 0.35. If you work out the thickness of the silicon and the thickness of the etch, you can figure out that it's 0.35. And it is made of that silica material. So we'll add that layer. And now we're ready to add that second layer, which will be the silicon layer. So I'll just take off the O2 and call it silicon. And it has a thickness of 0.2 microns, so a little bit different, thinner, very pretty thin compared to the wavelength. Same width, though. And it's made of silicon, and we'll add that as well. Now, to model that those air holes, we're actually going to not uh, sort of cut out the air hole. We're going to actually add an overlaying geometry, which will take precedence instead of actually removing geometry, we're going to be adding it and overriding it. So we'll create a new channel, or we'll just use the one here, the waveguide channel example, and all we have to do here is just set it to uh, air, so we'll just call it air, and however we need to make sure that the thickness and width are set up properly. Uh, the width isn't important really, but the thickness is. This will, has to be the same thickness as that the other waveguide we made, so they match up. And I'll apply it and, and store it. So now that hopefully I didn't make any mistakes, and we should be able to start setting up some of the geometry of this simulation. Let me minimize this, or I can actually, well, I'll just, I'll close it for now. I'm actually here still in the wafer properties. While, while I'm actually still here, I'm going to set the substrate material to silica that we created it. Now we can use it. And air is the cladding. And we're going to draw that straight rib waveguide, or ridge waveguide, right down the middle here. It doesn't have to be exact at first. We'll go in and edit it. Okay, I want it to match up with the beginning and end, so I'll just remove these offsets. 0 to 5.5, make it parallel. <clears throat> and we're going to want to use that profile we just created, the channel profile made from silicon. And that width, we're going to set it again to 0.47. That should be correct. Yes. And while I'm messing around with the layout, I'll draw that input plane here as well. Okay, so let's now look at what we just drew in 3D. We'll go to the 3D editor. Make sure. So this is looking pretty good. Look at the wireframe here, make sure I got the layers correctly. So we got the thicker layer down here, which is silica, and the top layer, which is the silicon, very thin. And we can look at it in the, uh, this, it's always also helpful to look at exactly what the simulator is going to use as a simulation, the material properties. So if we look at the XY plane, which is the plane of the waveguide, transverse plane, we can see the silicon layer up top has 3.48 about hectic index, silica is slightly lower, and then the air surrounding it in the blue is at one. All right, so that's looking good so far. And now, while we're here, let's look at the mode that's going to be calculated that's input plane. We should find um, a single mode. We want to inject a mode just like they do in the paper. So we'll go to the properties of the input plane and check modal input. And uh, I'll just remember I used point 0.2 here in my simulation previously. So I'll set that now. And then head over to 3D transverse and we're going to go to find modes. 
We're going to use finite difference because it's a high index contrast. The ADI will have a harder time finding an accurate mode. And then we can look for two modes. It should be single mode. Uh, it should be single mode. The second mode will be sort of a substrate mode that we'll see is mostly confined to the substrate. Right? So here is the X polarized mode of the uh, waveguide silicon core up top. And then there's a sort of a substrate mode, which is a bit lower, and it's actually leaking out into the substrate. <clears throat> so we're very confident we've got a single mode here. It's a pretty rough mesh. We could increase the mesh resolution to get a better mode solving. I'll set it back to one here because if we do the simulation with two modes solved, it'll inject the second mode into the simulation. We want it to inject the fundamental mode at one, the first mode. While I'm here also in the input plane, I'm going to change the wavelength here uh, just slightly. We know it's going to be centered more around 1.54, and we want to send in a pulse, right? That's what we showed in other, other examples this week. You want to use this pulse if you want a transmission spectrum or if you want to look at some trans, uh, some spectrum properties of, of a project. But we'll just use the default options here. It's got a pretty wide band signal and that'll be uh, very nice for our simulation. Okay, so we've got an input plane, we've got our waveguide. The one thing we're missing now, well, actually two things we're missing, is that photonic crystal and also uh, the detection objects that's going to detect the signal and calculate the quality factor using those uh, signals detected. So let's go ahead and use the photonic crystal tool to make this repeated structure. I'll click around here. And the first one's going to have four unit cells, right? So we're going to repeat it four times. That's down here with the C, uh, this is like the C vector of the periodic crystal structure, and that will that'll create uh, four unit cells. But now let's look over and make some expressions here to make some of this easier. As, you, as, we, got, as we were showing uh, yesterday and the days before, you can parameterize these objects by using variables. And I'm going to make one called period. Naturally, this is going to be the period of that photonic crystal structure, 1D photonic crystal structure. Okay, so this will keep that value steady over all the simulations, all, all the different objects. And also from that uh, paper, they have the defect size. So this is the length of that middle defect, and it's 0.63 microns, so we'll add that as well. And I don't want to have this, I want to set this beginning of the first photonic uh, repeated structure just to the right of the x-axis. So I'm going to make a variable here called start crystal. And if you uh, are more creative, you can make up even better variable names than I do. And then finally, I want to, I'll switch to the PowerPoint here to show you what I mean. I want to, I don't want to have to calculate where this second one starts, right? That's prone to error. I want to set the beginning of this one, maybe set where the input is and where the detection is then I want this second structure to automatically calculate where it should be positioned. And that is why we use these parameters. So now using those other ones I created here, I can create a variable called uh, begin second crystal. I like to change up my variable names because I get bored sometimes. And it's going to be equal to the position of the first crystal right, plus three times the period of the first one. So we're going to have one, two, three. And that is the period. And then we're going to add the defect size. And let's verify. OK, good. OK, so we got those parameters set up. And now we can just call them, right? So here, instead of one, I can just say period, and over here I can say uh, start crystal, 
and remove this offset. And finally, we should create a atom for this structure to use. It's going to be that circular air hole, and that uh, you can make circles with ellipses if you do it properly. So we'll start, and we'll use the electric waveguide as the atom. And the uh, I could have actually made this a parameter, but I'm just going to set it because we don't want to play with it. And it's going to be 0.1 micron. And we're going to use that structure we made the air one, the waveguide channel example. Accept those changes, accept that change, and now we have these four different atoms in this layout. Okay, just before we take that first break, I'm going to just make the second crystal. So let me do this quickly. I'm going to draw again another one. And we're going to use the variable name begin second crystal. This will create the offset that we need. We're going to center it at the x-axis. It's also going to be made up of four atoms and the whoops, and the uh, scale or the period is going to be equal to that period variable we created. And again, we're going to use that same atom. So if I hit new here, make sure the radius is 0.1, and we're using that waveguide channel example profile. We'll see it'll be created offset just enough and to the right of our first one. Okay, so here we got it in the 3D view. If we look at it in wireframe, it'll be more clear, right? So we have the waveguide structure, and now we've basically drilled or etched these air holes into it, leaving a defect in the middle, and we have the four remaining of it after it. Also, again, like I said, to verify, let's look at the refractive index profile um, in the 3D refractive index viewer. This is an XZ plane, and this scale here is the uh, Y value, so we'll just put it somewhere. And so we can see that, indeed, it's got the value of air inside those holes, and it's got the value of silica outside and air. Depending on where we put this slider here, we'll, maybe we'll get the silicon. Yeah, here we got the silicon. Okay, so before I continue anymore, let's take a quick break here, and Brian will ask you guys a poll, and he'll have some comments as well. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the questions box, and I'll see if I can answer them before we continue. Okay, thanks, Damien. Uh, we put up the uh, second poll for everybody. Um, please go ahead and take a look at that. We have uh, one more session for FTTV that's going to be at uh, uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's going to be run by uh, Scott Newman, our FTTV project lead. So if you haven't uh, signed up for that, please go ahead and do that. And if you have any questions uh, about anything, as always, feel free to uh, write it down, even if it's not a question, if it's a, a feature request or, uh, or a, an application that uh, um, you'd like to, to get simulated but you're not sure if it's a good fit for the tool or not, uh, just let us know. Uh, we're always here to, to help everybody out. If it's a good fit for FTC, we'll let you know. If it's not, we'll also let you know because we don't want to waste anybody's time. So. Uh, um, yeah, just let us know. I'll give it a couple more seconds. We we already answered uh, uh, all the questions that came in earlier via the chat system, so I don't see anything new at this time. So I'll go ahead and close the poll, pass it back to Damien, and he can uh, continue on with the, uh, with the session. Okay, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I don't see any we're any questions right now. I'll continue on to the example here. So we've created the geometry and we've pretty much shown that it's what we wanted compared to the paper, right? And so now we can start to investigate how we're going to determine the quality factor of the cavity that we've created here. 
And the way that they describe it in the paper, they don't describe the simulation uh, from, my, from my remembrance, at least my memory, they don't describe exactly how they set up the simulation, which always makes it a bit more difficult, but they do describe how they do it experimentally. And what they do is they basically inject a waveguide uh, mode, or they excite the waveguide mode um, really far away. We don't do it in the simulation because it would take too long to model that. But experimentally, it's not very hard to make this waveguide much longer. And they detect the signal at the output waveguide, which is also a fair distance away. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to set up a observation plane on the right side here, and also an observation point, right? So this uh, cavity is going to conf confine that light within it, and it'll actually try to keep it there. It'll take a long time for the light, or at least a relatively long time, for that light to leak out and get to the other side of this waveguide. So we need that observation point so we can look at the time domain information and make sure that that initial signal that excited the cavity mode has had time to leak out and we've actually got enough power at the output to make a reasonable calculation. So let's draw a point source over at about five microns. And we'll also draw a XY observation area. So this will look like a line in our current view, but it will be a plane in the 3D view. So the, oops, I did a, I did a, the wrong thing there. I meant to draw a observation point. And that's how you spell observation point. So let's set this to be, uh, we, we don't, right now it's defaulted to near the, um, uh, well, it's, it should be exactly at, let's say, 5.05. .05. Uh, it should be exactly on the x-axis, or the z-axis at zero. But we want this point to be somewhere within that core of that silicon waveguide. Right now, it's at zero, which is sort of at the bottom of the waveguide. It doesn't really make sense to detect a mesh point down there. So let's put it in the center. And if I can do my uh, math somewhat in a live fashion. I think the middle of that silicon waveguide should be about 0.45, I think. Uh, and we'll, we'll just confirm that in the 3D view. And now the observation area. Again, we'll want to place it <clears throat> at about 4.75, zero it along the z-axis, and then We'll give it an X length of the simulation domain. We want to capture all that power that's passing over this plane. And a Y length of 1.5. And the center depth should be about 0.25. And let's just make sure we get everything right here. That's good. So we can see the plane is now covering the whole simulation domain. And the observation point is nice and snug right in the center of that core of that waveguide. And actually, depending on the mode that's excited, I haven't really studied this because we just we just want to see how the power leaks out. But right, the fundamental mode usually has a peak power right in the center, right? Or since there's a high index down here, it might be shifted downwards a bit. But the higher order, if this waveguide had higher order modes, they usually have two nodes of uh, maxima or minima, and so they might be a little bit to the left and to the right. So when you're using the point observation point you might have to think about that, right? You only get one point, so you want to make sure that point is where it should be. Right now, we're looking at the fundamental mode, so if we put it far away from this perturbing structure, the fundamental mode should be the main thing we see there. Okay. And now, if we go to simulation parameters, uh, the simulation I ran before this 3D simulations always take a bit longer, obviously, than 2D. And so in the webinar type format, it makes more sense to show, um, to not show the whole simulation run. But I found that 0 0.02 was a pretty good value. And as discussed by Scott and reinforced by my own 
opinion, if you really wanted to be happy with your result, you should always do convergence analysis. But I have a paper to compare to, so I'm sort of a step ahead. And once I get to a close result, I can just stop there. And as Scott usually does, I also agree with him, you can round down the time step size to a nice reasonable level. This also makes it actually easier to calculate how many time steps you're going to run for. That's another argument for that. You can just say, okay, I want maybe uh, three, femtos three uh, femtoseconds or so, and you can easily multiply that to get the actual total time simulated. And now we want to run this actually for a lot more than the default time step size, time total number of time steps. The true value here is going to be something around 48,000. So a lot more than uh, the default chooses. And this is one of the main things you have to realize when you're doing a cavity type simulation. You have to make sure that the number of time steps is enough for the whole simulation to run. And that's why we use uh, sorry about that. And that's why we use the observation point to make sure the power has dropped down enough. One final thing before we run the simulation is uh, at the end we're going to want to see the spectrum, right? And we want to see the spectrum over a certain range of wavelengths. So you can put this up to a bigger number here to get a smoother plot. And we should expect something interesting from about 1.5 to 1.6. The peak should be somewhere within this range of wavelengths. So now we're pretty much at a, uh, a good stage to run our first simulation. Let's go ahead and just run the mode solving again and make sure that uh, we see this fundamental mode in a higher resolution. So we see that it's an X-polarized mode. It's got the major component of EX. It's good to verify. Okay, now we could run it. But as I said, these 3D simulations can take a much longer time. If you have a faster computer than one that, say, I have right here, it could be a lot faster. But this could take a couple of minutes, possibly 20 minutes or so, to complete the simulation. But another technique, well, not really a technique, but sort of a help, a way to see if everything's running smoothly or to debug maybe a design is to look at the observation objects as the simulation is happening. So we can go to runtime field view and look at a predefined observer. And we have our two observation objects, the area here and that point. So let's look at the, we knew that the mode was EX polarized. So let's look at the EX uh, value. And we see we haven't actually, so far in the simulation, there hasn't been time for the input pulse to reach that observation object over here. So we'd have to wait for a while longer. Maybe I'll let it run for a bit and I'll return to that um, when we actually have some results to see. Okay. So I ran the simulation beforehand, uh, obviously, and these are some of the results I got. So this is that observation point that I was showing uh, in the simulation domain. So we'll see at, if we waited to the end, we would get a signal that is at zero while it propagates over. And then this is the, sort of the initial excitation that's going to be sort of a transient error because the, the input pulse is going to be exciting that cavity mode. But once that's all died down, we're left with only the sort of the cavity uh, excitation of cavity mode, which will be slowly uh, leaking its power out both left and right, and it'll be decaying at a certain speed. So one way you can calculate the Q factor would be uh, to follow the slope of this observation uh, point. However, I don't suggest that unless your cavity has some pretty nice properties because we, as we saw in that calculation, it's the average power, the total energy divided by the power loss. And this only gives us uh, 
at one mesh point the amplitude. So first of all, you'd have to square this to get the intensity, which will be more should be proportional to the energy. But again, this is only one single mesh point of that cavity. If you could assume that the cavity had the same field everywhere, then you could extrapolate uh, to get the actual quality factor. But using one mesh point, uh, yeah, I would not suggest that. So using the, uh, I'll show again on the results, but I use the transmission spectrum the same way the paper does to calculate the Q factor. And I found a cavity resonance peak at 1.543 microns with a calculated quality factor of about 280. There might have been some decimals there that I cut off. In the paper, uh, their experimental results are a resonance at 1.56 microns and a quality factor of 265. However, their, uh, I should have actually written it down here probably, but their simulation results were actually at 1.547 microns and their quality factor was also at 280 uh, as well. So we matched the simulation results of that paper quite accurately. Now let's go back to our simulation here. Let's see if my delay has allowed the pulse to travel. Okay, so it has. This is actually, we're at an exciting time of the pulse propagation. Um, we're at about 0.1, so we're at about 10% of the input pulse amplitude, and this is around the maximum that we will receive. It might go up to 0.12 or 0.2. So this is like the that leading edge of that pulse reaching this observation point. But we have to wait a lot longer for that to die down to get a reasonable calculation for that quality factor. If we look at a result that I already calculated, right, it should be a very similar simulation. This is just one that's already completed. We can look at the observation point. So here we see that same, oh, let's go to the EX point. We see the same pulse, so it, there's a value up just under 0.2 here. This is sort of the leading, the excitation pulse that's going to excite the mode, and then it starts to die off uh, to the right. <clears throat> and if we look at transmission, this is the plane, this is the observation plane that I had set up. And this will gather all the power over that whole plane, so it's a lot more useful. If you look at the spectrum here, well, first of all, you'll see that, again, it looks like the fundamental mode, so that's good. At the output, we're detecting some excitation of the fundamental mode of the waveguide. If we look at the power spectrum, we see this nice peak at about 1.5 five four microns and in fact if you measure the peak like a quick way to do that is to use this info plane and set some markers like so so about the peak is at about 1.542 and oh, half that's about 0.27 so we can zoom in here and just place a rough marker yeah, about there, and then we can put one on the other side. They're not exactly matched up. And if we calculated the center wavelength, A, 1.542, divided by B minus C, 0 0.0054, you should get something around 280. Um, and that would be equal to the quality factor of this cavity. So that's what I wanted to show for the um, at cavity, and I have one more plot here to show you, not really related to how you calculate the uh, quality factor, but it might help you understand maybe what's happening in the simulation. If I can, yeah, here we go. So in this simulation, I just put an observation plane within that silicon waveguide to see how the power moves over the whole plane of transmission, plane of propagation. Here. And we see that uh, this crystal structure is working pretty well as we're at reflecting because we excite right about here and we get a standing wave here of the forward traveling mode and the backward traveling mode. You can see what the amplitude of the backward traveling uh, mode would be right here. And then there's some type of penetration within the P 
complicated structure, and this is the, well, at least it's very close to what the cavity mode would look like. There's a bit of interference with the uh, transmission and reflection wave, forward and backward propagating waves. This is somewhat, this is where the cavity mode is um, excited, and you can see it's allowing the field that excites this cavity to leak out to the far side. So we're detecting a very small amount of power over here that's been able to uh, transmit over this uh, cavity, sort of like tunneling of electrons through potential wells. Yeah, so that's uh, what I want to show. And this was just one example, and maybe a slightly older example of cavities, but it also applies to new cavities that you'd want to simulate. The idea is to set up your excitation source and then detect how that uh, cavity is excited and how it decays to calculate the quality factor. <clears throat> so we have, have some extra time. So if you have any questions, write them in here. But I'll talk about a few things to clearly show what I meant by cavity-specific problems. So this is not exactly a cavity I'm showing on the PowerPoint here, but it is a type of resonance. And uh, so we're exciting this surface plasma on this silver nanoparticle, and the field is getting is trapped on this particle and is traveling around it and is slowly leaking the wave out um, off the surface. And if you don't run, so this is the spectrum with the run one simulation, right? We get this peak here where the uh, <clears throat> this input wave is coupling to this surface plasmon on the or resonance on this particle, and but we also get this very sort of rippled effect on the transmission spectrum. And you'll it clearly shows that if you run it for a certain amount of time steps, you might get a somewhat messy uh, simulation. But if you run it for even longer and wait for that energy to leak out, you'll get a much smoother, and much more closer to reality. Uh, result. So this is very important to an, a cavity type simulation as well. If you see those ripples, then you might want to put up observation point and see if that power is decaying enough. Um, it's another remark. Everything else was exactly the same between these two simulations. The mesh size, the mesh, the time step, everything else was exactly the same. Only the number of time steps was changed, and you get a much better result. And to go along with that uh, example there, and in examples tomorrow will probably be shown that we can use a non-uniform mesh, right? So the in the simulation I did with the cavity, we could probably get a better result. Since that silicon has a pretty high index compared to the, the air surrounding it, there's a pretty high uh, index contrast, and we might decide to use a non-uniform mesh. So in this case, it's demonstrating a uniform mesh of that nanoparticle. And then over here, we've employed a non-uniform mesh, which will resolve that particle much better uh, along the boundaries and result in a more accurate simulation. <clears throat> so at this time, I'd like to, like to thank you guys for listening to me this week and, and uh, coming to our webinars. And uh, you saw a reference there. This material will be available as a handout. If you have any questions, write them in the question box. I'll hand it over to Brian to do one final poll and make some closing remarks. Thanks, Damien. Good presentation. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for, uh, for attending all the sessions up to this point. We have one day left. And I know a lot of, uh, a lot of names that I'm seeing here have uh, come to quite a few of the sessions. So. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, for doing that and, and uh, submitting your questions and uh, basically uh, sitting down and uh, absorbing all the information that's been thrown at you from all our presenters. So we do have a couple questions. I'm going to try to delay the uh, uh, the time a little bit so Damien can can get through those. Um, but yes, yeah, so the last session for FTT is tomorrow at 3 p.m. Uh, we have three other uh, other sessions earlier on in the day. And uh, yeah, the other thing that you guys can do too is let us know what you thought of this uh, 
uh, this webinar week. It's the first time that we've thrown together something like this. And um, we're trying to figure out how useful th this is to the community. And if, uh, if you guys are, are making good use of this, like this, is, this can be used as a good uh, training tool for you uh, to pick up the software. Um, and maybe you'd like to see more introductory courses, that'd be, uh, that'd be nice to know. Or if you're more interested in us just really diving deep into specific applications, and uh, I guess more specifically the applications that you guys are working on uh, individually, uh, also let us know that uh, we're basically taking in as much information that we can from the, from the audience, and uh, um, we're going to use that to formulate new uh, webinars in the future. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Damien to uh, answer some of these questions. All right, thanks for the questions, everyone. We've got some interesting ones here. Let me go hit the first one. Okay, the question is about the observation plane. Does it monitor the total forward propagating power or only the power in the mode? That's a good question. Uh, you might be, maybe you watch the Opti BPM uh, presentation and maybe you, you are confused or maybe mixed up. So no, in fact, the, in FDTD, uh, it's going to be, it actually will display or it monitors the total field propagating forward, also propagating backward. That's why you can have a negative power sometimes if you don't if you don't uh, normalize. So if you have a backward traveling wave, the pointing vector is going to be pointing along the negative z direction and that's uh, why you get a negative value there. Um, so yeah, no, it doesn't it doesn't tell you the power in the mode. It tells you uh, the total power. Where actually it will calculate the pointing vector. That's exactly what it does. <laughs> Time averaged power flowing through the plane. Okay. Um, Another question here is about will I explain how to set up the non-uniform mesh and I don't think there's time today to show that but we had a webinar in the past on that subject I'm not I think the power the presentation might be on our website but I will make a note to tell Scott Newman and he will hopefully uh, talk about this tomorrow in his webinar on Opti FTTD as well so maybe I can I can coax him to do that um, in addition to his other material. Another question here is to a good check of convergence is to check um, a decrease in power of the reflectance in the power spectrum. Um, I don't think, I'm trying to think if that makes sense. Depends. So, I would say I don't completely understand the question, but I think I maybe I know what you're getting at. Um, for example, if we so if, if we look at that transmission spectrum back there, um, right here, you'll see it goes up to some value of 0.6 or so, right? That's how much power has been detected at the output. So uh, if we don't run the simulation long enough, right, what is this plot going to show? It's going to show zero because no power has reached the output because simulation wasn't long enough. Um, the longer we wait, the more power is going to reach it. In a case where there's no cavity or no resonance, uh, it'll reach it very quickly and just propagate through it. But in a cavity, you might have to wait longer. So uh, if you want to see Another way to see if you've waited long enough is to make sure uh, this peak isn't increasing a lot with the simulation time. If you run it, say, for some number of time steps and then run it uh, for longer time steps and this plot here changes drastically, then that would be telling you that you should trust the results of the second simulation more, perhaps, or at least you haven't converged yet. Maybe do another simulation with, that's even longer. Uh, to make sure that this this spectrum should be leveling off at some point because that cavity should be uh, uh, leaking out all its power, right? The FDT simulations, since most of them usually have uh, 
at least two band absorbing boundary conditions, or all of them are absorbing boundary conditions. The power after excitation is done, that energy should be flowing out of the summation domain and being absorbed by those boundaries. So the summation should always sort of die out after a while. And that's something you want to look for and make sure you are setting up properly. Okay, so there are some upper questions here that are a little more technical, and I think that I can answer them more specifically over email. It's a better medium to answer these types of questions. But uh, thanks for listening again. It was a great week for me, and hope to see you tomorrow for our final presentations. And I'll hand over to Brian one last time. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and uh, I hope to see you all as well tomorrow for our uh, last four sessions. Have a good night.